Well, first of all, thank you, Patrick, for organizing this, and it's a privilege to be here with all of you. And thank you, uh, those who spoke uh, before me. Uh, I actually want to pick up uh, two strands. One that, that Julie kind of left off at the very end, very intriguingly, about unpacking religiosity in Denmark and by extension, I think, in Europe. Uh, and then I think the other strand actually is um, the list, the long list of what the future of Mormon studies ought to be that uh, Patrick presented. And I'll, um, I think it would be out of character for me if I agreed with the list. Um, and actually, I'd like to use my time today to push against that, um, because I think that if we, in fact, follow exclusively that list, then I think we amount to navel-gazing and amount to a lot of, I think, uh, revision of how institutions operate uh, rather than what we ought to do with those institutions. And I think that instead of just looking inwards and backwards, I think we ought to look forward. We ought to be more confident about ourselves. So I'll address that a little bit at the very end of my remarks. The first, the first question that I actually had as I was presented uh, with this uh, topic was, is that even accurate, post-religious Europe? Right. Um, as I mentioned, I was at a presentation this last uh, Wednesday. We organized actually by the Kosovo Specialist Chambers in Brussels, a uh, a uh, policy forum. And on the way in from Albania, I had to separate. Right. So there is those who ask, "Do you have a European passport?" And then other. And then, of course, I'm Albanian. I have a U.S. passport, but I'm Albanian. Am I European? Of course, what the question implied, all right, is are you an EU member state citizen or not? But I think it's important for us to be clear when we use these terms, both post-religious and secondly, European. What do we mean post-religious and what do we mean European? And I think, like I said, Julie uh, made a really, did a really good job. I think, I think unpacking that aspect of religiosity, secularism, and what it means to be religious. Um, and she, she, she gave us several dimensions on that. I, I want to show you a series of maps. There's about four or five of them. They're not my original research. Most of them are from Pew Research uh, Center. They've done a lot of work on religion. But before starting with religion, I actually want to kind of give us a good idea of this is a map of the human development capital, right, index that is in Europe. You can see a shift, right, that the darker the color, the better off, the lighter, worse off. You see a shift from north to south, from east to west, right? This is all Europe, but it's not one Europe, right? North, south, east, west. Uh, here's another one, GDP per capita. Again, the same kind of divide, north, south, east, west. And these are important to keep in mind because we, we tend to see these things kind of like in a monolith, and then we tend to clump all of them, European experiences all together. And I think, and this is where I'm especially thankful to Patrick for inviting, I think, this very kind of different collection of individuals here, because I think it's important to keep this in mind that we're talking about different, especially in Europe, but I think elsewhere. Uh, and I'll show you a map of Albania at the very end of how that changes, uh, even within a very small country the size of Israel. Uh, here is the impact of inward and outward migration. All right, so this is demographics. And this is basically Europe's challenge for the next 25, 30 years, or the West's, rather, challenge for the next 25, 30 years. The brown, right, are movements out of the countries. You have population loss in those countries. Blue and light blue, obviously, you have, uh, you can see right here, this is about zero to six per, I think it's per, uh, per thousand inhabitants. And if it is brown, you're losing population because of outward migration. Uh, and others. This, of course, accounts for migration from within these countries to other countries, but also from outside of Europe as a whole, uh, especially from the Middle East and uh, African countries. Okay? So again, we have very different challenges. We have very different demographics. We have very different ideas about what is Europe. And each European country and, and different parts within Europe Again, I think Belgium is the best example of this. We're talking about Flanders and Walloons, and you, know, you, you don't know when you're where, and you have very different systems of education, and also where, where you worship and how 
you worship, and even outlook on life. And I must say that uh, Deku's uh, list sounds very much like somebody from Antwerp would come up with. Uh, and I suspect that somebody like Christian Rar that was mentioned here would come up with a very different list. And, uh, and uh, myself as well, I think, would come up with a diff different list of questions. And so I think it's important for us to critically approach those kinds of questions instead of just taking them at face uh, value. Uh, let me present to you another uh, picture here. Uh, blue are Catholic countries, majority Catholic countries in Europe. Again, redefining what is to be religious. Uh, Protestant are the ones in purple. The ones in red are Eastern Orthodox. Uh, by the way, and I'll touch on that, I'll focus quite a bit on, uh, on some data on the Orthodox, I think, uh, present in, in Europe because we don't talk about it. Uh, we talk about apostasy as if it happened, but you know, Eastern Orthodox Church is mostly untouched by apostasy or at least what we think of the apostasy. And so, we, again, we tend to be very Western-minded, West European-minded, in, in the way we approach our narratives, both in Mormon studies and elsewhere. And part of it has to do because we don't have anybody, perhaps, from those areas. Uh, or I think that you know, we only now are getting that first generation of those missionaries that served in those countries. And Albania was in 1992, uh, first missionary. So I imagine now we'll probably get that first batch of those who have studied and will go back, as you have in Denmark, will go back and start digging up, I think, some of those narratives. Uh, and then green is where you have predominantly Muslim countries, okay? So again, Islam is another of those issues. When we talk about religiosity in Europe, uh, that we tend to get wrong. Because while it is true that Christianity is losing, by 2050, according to Pew Research Center, we lose about 100 million uh, they, let's say, believers in a traditional sense of the word, people that no longer, they are called unaffiliated. We'll lose about 100 million of them in Europe. Uh, the Muslim population will increase by, by, uh, by about 5%, so twofold what it is right now. So between 2015 and 2050, you get about, on an average, about 10.2% of the European population as a whole, uh, even if migration stopped right now from the Middle East you'd get 10.2% uh, of, of the uh, European population would be Muslim. By the way, in the United States, by 2050, the same thing will happen. Uh, not 10%, but it'll be actually higher than the Jewish population. would be the second highest um, religious uh, uh, denominator in, uh, in, in the United States. So it's the same, similar dynamics. Actually, Islam between now and 2050 will reach parity with Christianity worldwide. Uh, you'll get to, about, I think it's about 32%, I think, of, of the world population uh, between Islam and Christianity. So that's about, and then I think by 2075, if population trends continue, of course, short of a war and other kind of exogenous shocks to, to the international system, I think that we, uh, well, we know that uh, Islam as a whole will have more adherence than Christianity uh, worldwide. Uh, but, but again, these are, so when we talk about a post-religious Europe, do we mean a post-Christian Europe? Do we mean a secular Europe? Do we mean an Orthodox Europe? Do we mean a Muslim Europe? And other implications. And the question then becomes for Mormonism, in my view, more interesting question for Mormonism becomes, how do we engage with this new reality? Right? Rather than, you know, is correlation good or bad? Right? Because if we have a notice, correlation is on the way out, right? So, so it's, it's like we're studying you know, dinosaurs and, and, and things of the past. It's not relevant. Of course, we can learn about things from the past. It's absolutely important that we, we, we do so. But I think we need to be a little bit more confident rather than just engage in navel gazing and just look at all the things that are going right or wrong with us instead of actually just take what we have and see what we can offer as we unpack what it means to be religious. And that's why I think Drew's remark was so important there because we don't have to engage with every aspect of religiosity in Europe or with European countries. We engage with aspects of being religious and being spiritual. Uh, by the way, when we ask a question, especially the Scandinavian, are you, do you believe in God? Very few of them say yes. If you ask, are you spirit, do you believe? Do you believe in something higher than you? Then the overwhelming answer is yes. 
right? So, so th those are the, the kind of dichotomies and the thing. That's why I think unpacking is so important, because if we just take these very monolithic categories, that we end up getting it all wrong. I think we did the same thing with Soviet Union. I think during well with the whole communist bloc, because uh, we tended to think of China, or Soviet Union, everything all together. And then it took us a while to figure out, wait a second, these guys all have their own individual interests. Let's see what we can do. Let's see if we can unpack this and then just deal with this as, as it comes. Let me uh, focus for just a second because Albania is down here. My work is in Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, Greece, and Cyprus, which uh, is right here. Um, and, uh, and so I've had the opportunity to travel quite a bit, uh, see uh, the impact both of Mormonism in these countries and also of these countries with Mormonism. Uh, in my both professional and ecclesiastical responsibility, I've had the opportunity to, to deal with these, uh, with these issues. And they change country by country. And within each country, they vary by region. And so again, a, a precaution about just how we approach uh, these questions and this question of post-religious uh, Europe. So this is a map of uh, religious majorities in Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, the lighter blue ones are Catholic countries, mostly, whereas the ones that are a bit purple, that's Eastern Orthodox, or not necessarily just Russian Orthodox, but Eastern Greek Orthodox and others. Albania has an independent Orthodox church. Uh, Armenia obviously has the oldest called the Armenian Apostolic Church, Try and convince them of the apostasy. Uh, uh, we, we used to worship in Albania uh, in, a, in a building that was built where the old forum used to be during Roman times. And so Albania is one of those countries where Christianity arrived through Paul's preachings uh, in the westernmost part of Illyricum. And that would have been uh, Durakium, Duras, the town where I live. And so we often kind of try to echo, right, and try to understand, okay, so Paul was here, he was preaching, we can be as Paul. But again, you start asking yourself, right, and you say, okay, so do we have, what, what exactly is our right and our place in this society as we engage with it and as we share what we have? And, and how, at the end of the day, can we reconceptualize what we mean by missionary work? What does it mean to engage in the society? What does it mean to contribute to societies? If we take President Hinckley's dictum at face value, our goal is to make bad people good and good better, then there's about a million different ways to do that short of baptism. And so if that is the question, and that is the goal, and that is the pursuit, then I think there's also a million different ways of going about Right, doing missionary work. I know Patrick has a wonderful upcoming, forthcoming, just ward theory, um, and uh, and and I think we need to we need to kind of make ourselves a bit more uncomfortable with these questions, so that we can be comfortable with different solutions. And I think these are more promising and more interesting. I think, in my opinion, of course, I could be wrong, but promising, I think, venues of Mormon studies. So here is a breakdown of the religious landscape. This is from the latest uh, Pew Research Center. There's some wonderful uh, work. Uh, this is long-term study. But you can look here, people who identify as. Now again, what is it to be religious? If you look at these countries, Europe is in good shape. Central and Eastern Europe, 90% Christian. Wonderful. But then when you ask how many times are you going to church, we're doing okay <laughs> compared to them. We have a beautiful Orthodox church right in the city center in, in Albania. And our Christmas parties uh, are far bigger than theirs. We actually had the mayor of the city come to ours. I don't think they did anything except for put a strand of lights just outside because nobody goes to church. Right? So then the, the question is, are they religious? Is this a post-religious Europe? I mean, is that what we call by post-religious a secular Europe? No, if you ask them, absolutely not. In fact, the greatest challenges, and here's a twist, and I'm not sure that I buy the argument I'm about to propose, but, but maybe to think a little bit outside the box. The interesting challenge that we have 
is that church growth is, is slowest in Central and Eastern Europe. In areas where Orthodox Christianity is actually more embedded. Partly because of these notions, when you're talking about Denmark in the 1840s, I'm thinking Greece in the 2000s. Right? It's, it's a badge of honor for every missionary who serves in the Greece Athens mission, soon to be the Adriatic South mission with headquarters in Albania. So we have finally expanded the borders of Albania to its traditional <laughs> historical. Uh, this is recorded, isn't this? OK. Uh, I take all that back. Uh, that is, yeah, that's not good. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can edit that, can't we? Thank you. All right, let's edit that. So let's, <laughs> let's start again. So you know, for missionaries going to the Greece Athens mission, um, uh, going, to, going to jail, right, is a badge of honor. Most of them, actually, I was talking to one that had just, Elder Dini Chachi, who was a 70 now, he served a mission there. Uh, and, uh, you know, he said, well, some of them try to get themselves in trouble. Uh, but, but tales of them getting fights with the priests, not the metropole, but the priests, usually the, our deacons would be the equivalent in our church, not by age, but by position. Then uh, you would very likely... Uh, go to jail. And so you've, we've had several of those incidents there. Uh, the same problem exists actually uh, in Europe, in, where in countries with Muslim majorities. Uh, is, the best example of that is in Kosovo, of course. We've had some uh, problems uh, with missionaries there. We've had to move missionaries out, and we've had to close a couple of areas. So, so there's a couple of these areas where the, the closest religious identity is to national identity. Right? then the more likely you are, or less likely you are, to actually persuade people. So our priesthood leaders in Macedonia, for example, who come from a Muslim community, but to be a Muslim is to be Albanian, to be Orthodox, or to be Christian is to be Macedonian. Right? Converting to Christianity is anathema, because the, it's, a, it's a demographics war. And so you're identifying yourself with the opposite camp. So we understand these challenges, and we understand what the implications they are for, for, for the church. So how do we engage in these kinds of communities as a result of that? Uh, so here is Albania. Green is Muslim. Uh, red is Catholic, I believe, yes. And then purple is Orthodox. So this is what Albanians identify. There was a study that was just released in January of this year, January 15th, I think it's World Religion Day. And uh, across the Balkans, the sense of religiosity is quite high. 50, 60, 70 percent of people count themselves religious. You go to Albania, it's 34 percent, which was interesting, was shocking. Um, but then it kind of got me thinking a little bit. And again, this is just, I'm not sure that I buy my argument on this, but I think it's something to think about. So Albania has the highest baptism rate in the region. Uh, we're actually the only stake in about 17 countries. We have about 3,000 members, uh, and uh, about 800 of them are under the age of 30. Of course, the same kind of uh, parathetical supply here in terms of activity rates and everything else as elsewhere. But when you compare that with everything else, Albania is actually the second highest baptizing country in Europe after Cape Verde. Uh, Portugal and Spain get pretty close. Cape Verde is off the coast of Portugal, if you don't know. African little islands, but they're actually part of the Europe area and part of their administered through Portugal. Uh, but Albania is, is the next uh, highest uh, baptizing country. And like I said, it took about 20 years for it to actually have its own stake, which was, by European standards, actually is quite fast. Uh, and uh, not perhaps by American standards and others, but by European standards at least, that is, that is quite high. So this is the interesting question for me then was, is it possible that this detachment between identity, national identity, and religious identity that is happening across Europe might actually have a silver lining you know, behind it. Is it possible that by detaching, by becoming unaffiliated, and I understand that a lot of them are going towards a very secular, right, anti-religious, anti-theistic. I'm surrounded by them when I'm in Belgium. Um, I, I 
my work is at the Free University of Brussels, which is known as a kind of like as a center of Freemason and uh, a bastion of Freemasonry and Enlightenment kind of thinking. But, but the, question, the, the, the question then is, but is it possible for us to find ways to engage with this unaffiliated majority? Most of these countries by 2050 in Western Europe will be unaffiliated. Great Britain will be, is one of the exceptions. We'll get about 50% Christianity. But the rest of them, Germany, will be mostly unaffiliated by that time, meaning they have detached themselves from their religious roots, from their family, religious heritage. And so what are the possibilities here, the opportunities here? How do we engage with, with, these, uh, with, these, uh, with these people? So let me then, can I have one minute? Is it OK? Uh, when, when Patrick listed this, all these questions, I thought, well, I, sh I should have had these questions, and I could have just done this uh, instead of this. <laughs> Because it's very, they're very interesting, and a lot of them, so they are interesting questions. And, and I think that we ought to engage with them. But I, I don't think in, in the way that perhaps at least I understood them. I don't think it's, is, is there an obligation to uniformity? I don't care. I don't, I don't think this is important. I don't think it's important partly because, again, I'm in Albania. Yes, I have to report to my Right? My ecclesiastical leaders to the area authority and to general authority, state authority, and the area presidency. I have to do that, but I have the ability as a priesthood leader, right, to, to make decisions that are necessary for the membership. Right? And perhaps it's my particular position traveling across that large swath of, of Southeast Europe, but we do have the ability to do things. Actually, what I've found is that the challenge is not the brethren. The challenge is that what I call, you know, the rise of the managerial class in the church, right? We have this extra spare tire around us that is stopping a lot of that, I think, a lot, a lot, of, that, a lot of that conversation that is happening. And so it's not that we don't have this flexibility. I think we just have to take it and make it our own. We, we went through a process of, of, of getting the hymn books in Albania. And you know who the biggest obstacle to actually getting Albanian songs in the hymn book? was not Germany or Salt Lake, it was the Albanian saints, some of them who did not have the vision perhaps at the time to incorporate those. Now we're going through the primary hymn book and we're doing that, uh, incorporating local hymns and others. We have that flexibility. You know, is, is English? Well, yeah, of course, having known English is an advantage. Of course, you know, there, there are certain aspects that are obvious, but the question is what do we do with this now? So let me, uh, my personal experience in Albania, Understanding that you know, the missionary work is over here, what do we as members do? And so this year is actually, we have stretched this 25th anniversary. In 1992, we had the first missionary, so last year we celebrated 25th anniversary. This year was the year that Elder Oaks came dedicated on 23rd of April, the land in Albania. And so we just done two years, the 25th anniversary. Frank, Frankfurt asked us when we talked about public affairs funding, they said, well, we did this last year. I said, yeah, but this is a different 25th anniversary. <laughs> And, 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 uh, and, and in fact, so we're, doing, we're doing this. And so what, what do we do? Well, we know that Albanian people are very keen on arts. They love painting and photography and poetry and music. So that's what we do. So every year we organize a, uh, well, this year uh, is a photography exhibit nationwide. It started in Tirana, then we travel. We went to another town, and then this Saturday we're going to yet another town. And the theme is modern iconography. We want to redefine what it is right, that we worship, how we worship. And so somebody submitted a picture of the dog. My wife is an artist, accepted it. I wasn't too keen on it, but she did. Somebody else of a wedding scene, somebody else of a temple, somebody else of a mountain. These are non-members that are submitting this kind of work. And this is, I think, a way to engage. Last year was the colors of my family. How would you portray in painting your family? And so we had 80 submissions, over 50 artists, two of them LDS. And you have media coverage, and you have everything else that is related to that. Uh, in the fall, we were organizing a poetry program, Inspired Verses. And then we want to come up with a little book with Albanian poets who have written inspired, not spiritual, but inspired verses. I think these are ways you can engage in a religious, post-religious Europe. 
These are ways that I think we can engage without having to do navel gaze and say, okay, just engage on this kinds of stuff. We are, we are actually commissioning a survey of religiosity among millennials in Albania, and then we'll engage university students on this issue. And the same thing I think we can do with other areas. Let me propose one final one that I, I was telling Melissa about this. I think that we ought to do a lot more in terms of the future. We ought to do a lot more with the implications of artificial intelligence. In what ways can Mormonism contribute to the way we think about the coming age of robotics? Is violence against robots good or bad? Do you have to go to the bishop if you kick your robotic dog or your robotic servant? What about virtual reality and sin? How do we engage with that when our youth will engage in virtual reality? Is that the same as breaking the law of chastity or the, your covenants in a virtual reality? What about bioethics? What about other areas that we perhaps have not considered yet? I think, to me, those are far more interesting questions, not because I'm interested in those. I couldn't, figure, I, I, I couldn't answer those questions but because I think they reflect Mormonism in the 21st century as it ought to be, confident in what it is and how it presents to the world. Thank you.